Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And I'm so excited today to continue talking about the HBO show industry with the wonderful Connor McNeil. Um, and I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about auditioning for the show. I know a lot of the actors were coming into this as, as kind of one of their first big projects. And so there was a lot of self-tape auditioning and was curious if that was the same process that you went through or whether you were there in person and just kind of how you mapped out and, and prepped for an audition because obviously you never have all of the details of the character. So you're always kind of putting together an interpretation based off those few lines that you have. Yeah, um, I, so I was, I was doing a show in New York at the time um, and it was a, a play, an Irish play and a lot of the other the boys have been taping for it as well at the same time. So I actually didn't get a, an audition for it until the week after they'd already taped for it. And I was like, oh, why am I not getting seen for this Irish part? Um, but then when it came in, you're right. It was interesting when I first read it, he read as my first instinct reading was like, he's angry, he's nasty. And then very quickly I was like, no, there has to be, there was just glimmer of something that I knew was a bit more. So I tried to humanize him as much as I could and steer away from doing something that was just a tape that was like quite angry and, and full on because I it, he was very easy to do that with, do you know what I mean? He was very easy to slip in the stock character. Um, and so I kind of avoided that, which was what the boys intended and what they were looking. So then I had a recall when I was in New York on Zoom with Mickey Conrad and Lachlan, one of our producers at Bad Wolf. And I'd done that meeting and they, like, we just spoke about the character for so much and they were so brilliant and very clear on what they wanted with me. And then I went and taped again and then I like didn't hear anything for ages. And I was like, oh, that's gone. And then I was at back in London and was it got a call to go and do a chemistry read, which was at that chemistry read, there was nearly all of us. There was one or two people who weren't there, but generally like Freya was there and um Harry was there and David and stuff. And we were we all went up and Mahala was flown over for it for the meeting, and we went up together as a team done the uh like chemistry reads together as a team with no one else reading our parts just us and we all have been like oh, i'm not sure if we'd nailed it there and we it was only until afterwards once we all got the roles we were like we were the only people meeting that day of course that's what they had planned but yeah so it was kind of a long process and that was about april i'd say maybe um but yeah so that was the kind of my journey with auditioning for it yeah, and then once you started getting some of the scripts, once you had the role, what's kind of your process and, and how does that look in the way that you then take the scripts and deconstruct the character and figure out how you want to kind of bring them to life off the page? There was a lot of, there was a lot of chat with Mickey and Conrad before, um, which was brilliant and really, really helpful. I, what, what was very clear from those guys is they wanted to humanize him as much as possible without, you know, you cannot avo avoid what Kenny is. You cannot avoid the fact that he is misogynistic. He is manipulative. He's a, a bully for want of a better word, but he is those things, but he's also a, a fully rounded person as well, which the, I, I found that the more normal I made him, the kinder I tried to make him, the more horrible it was because then it became very gaslighty and quite is he being nice? I don't know if he's being nice today or if he's not being nice, which is the real version of people like that, isn't it? You don't know what way you're going to get them. And that's what is scary. And, and sort of the stakes instantly become incredibly high because you don't know what version you're going to get. So I did that. I'd done some research, not a huge amount, but the writing was there as well. Mara, that was the thing. Like it was on the page. Like they were very clear and very smart writers. But I'd done a little bit of research. I read, there's a book called City Boy. I read that. I went and worked, or not worked, I went and sat beside a friend who works in City. I sat on his train room floor with him for a day, um, which was really good fun. And more importantly, actually, I went out for drinks. I got him to take, I was like, take, bring me to the most notorious city bars, the most notorious bars for, for uh, bankers. And so we went to a few bars and had a few drinks, and I just kind of sat and watched as much as I could and tried to eavesdrop on conversations a lot. Um, yeah, so that was kind of my approach to to get into it but the, the majority of it was on the page it really was and and I suppose just trying to make them real is the is the main aim of yeah the that's so interesting that part of your research was actually going out to some of the bars and some of the some of the night spots because one of the things that really struck me in watching the show 
is the way that it just encapsulates such a specific nightlife within London, within finance. Is yeah. that something where you were then just like really pulling those those details in? And, and what did you feel were the aspects of the way that they socialize together after work beyond just the fact that like everyone in London goes to the pub with their co-workers anyway? Yeah, they're still they're still carrying work, aren't they? Like everything's still going to be carried onto the floor the next day. And everybody's kind of nobody's really got each other's back, really. I don't think in this show. I don't know if that's that's I don't know how real the life that is once you're working in a place like that. But um I think I think Mickey and Conrad obviously work there, so I think they're pretty close to it. But yeah, that that was um that was probably the most educational thing I could have done was sit in those bars and watch because it is about what's off the floor as just as much as what's on the floor it impacts all of these guys, doesn't it? And actually, even the relationship I have with uh, Marisa, who plays Yasmin, you know, what happens to us off the floor is what really impacts our relationship on the floor. And I try to keep it business as usual on the floor, even though this is looming over and I'm still your manager. I'm still your senior. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very useful. Yeah. I don't know I'm, if I answered your question there. I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. Cause it really just like every single moment, like they're never able to let the job go. At any time yeah. In the show. And I also, I, I thought it was interesting because, you know, it's such an ensemble show and your character specifically with Kenny, we kind of don't really see very much of him in that first episode. And we start to see more and more of him as the show goes on. And like, we mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about his backstory and why he behaves the way that he does. Um, but that first episode must have been such an interesting experience because there's still so many shots where you're all just out on the floor, every single character's present almost the entire time whenever there's office scenes. So was it kind of an interesting experience to, to be able to just hang back and just watch all these interactions in that 100%. way? 100%. And great for like, look, any job anybody gets, you're always nervous. You know, your first day of any job, and, that, and I think that goes for acting big time because you're so nervous about whether you're making the right choices or whether you're doing what they want, I don't know. But so that gave me so, it was such a lovely ease into yeah. that w world, but also in the getting into Kenny a lot because a lot we st had the improv a lot in the background. A lot of you, you were on the phones, you were doing the thing. So you were getting into that vibe and how he walks and moves and all of that. So it was so useful and just soaking up that atmosphere on the floor of, especially when they've done huge weights and you've all, everybody, essays, everyone is screaming and shouting down phones and trying to trade and deal. And that creates such a buzz. So getting that into your bones was really useful. Um, I loved doing that. I loved getting to watch the other guys as well. That's the one thing about the show, you know, whether you, you love it or hate it, the acting's really good. The acting's so good from everyone. And I loved getting to watch people first and see the vibe of what people were going for and then being able to dig in in episode two. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting in, in respect to the fact that every single character has an interaction with every single other person. Um, so did you find yourself having to really think about what that relationship would be with a lot more characters and a lot more scene partners than you would normally just because of the number of people who are in those scenes and the way that everything just flows throughout the floor? Totally. And also just like even things like how loud you're being, because at the end of the day, Eric's desk is there. If I'm screaming and shouting, Eric can hear me. Or uh, Mark Dexter, who plays Wyndham, uh, my boss, is down there. So when I'm with Yasmin, I'm very conscious of so it did shape everything, you know, and um, it, it made it really fun. It also just made it really fun to, to shoot with everyone all the time. And that's why we all became so close is it, if you were in that scene on paper or not, you were in that scene because you would have been at your desk. So everybody was in constantly and that it really did create a real environment of, of a workplace. And you kind of felt like, I felt like I worked on that training room floor. I get picked up, dropped off there. And that's where you go into that studio every day and sit down and you're at that desk for however long we're shooting for that day. Um, so yeah, we were peer point people. Yeah. By the end. <laughs> and were you living in, in the same apartments as a lot of the rest of the cast when you were filming? Yeah, we were all in the same block um, down by the bay, which was really good fun. Yeah. And loved it. And right by the sea as well in Cardiff, which was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about the construction of Pierpoint as a company, because it kind of almost features as a little bit of a character of, of a company. There's so many details 
about it, about the work culture there, you know, even down to a staffer leaves and there's an article that they write that's an expose, you know, mm -hmm. so even beyond the things that we see with interactions with all of the different characters. So it's interesting kind of what the creative team talked to you about in what are the specifics of this particular financial company? What is it that sets it apart? The good, the bad, the ugly, and kind of all those in-between elements that they really, really crafted out to make it so layered. I, I think like in the show, I'm pretty sure that Prayanga says it, that, that young people are their capital. They are the company that are hiring the most young people. They want to put a new face on banking is the sense that you get from Pierpoint. Um, they're trying to be as diverse as possible, but then you very you realize very quickly that that's a lot of its optics, isn't it? Um, and the uh, the truth underneath is still pretty rotten and, and the patriarchy still rules. But uh, yeah, that, 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 that kind of was the vibe of what the company was that basically putting a new sheen on something that once you scratch the surface underneath is a bit decaying still and they haven't really changed their tune yeah and in terms of the directors working on the show you had Lena Dunham coming in and directing that very first episode which was interesting because you know she was coming in to direct something that wasn't a script that she'd actually written which usually mm -hmm. is kind of what she's working on and so I wanted to ask about the experience of, of her coming in and directing that first episode and the way that she really kind of creatively and visually just set the tone for, for what the show was going to look and feel like so that as the other directors came in they could really just continue to grow and expand upon that with all of you. I totally she done Lena was a big fan of making me improv which I loved and, and not a lot of it was used but I think it helped in the long run of of creating Kenny and who Kenny was and, and, and pushing that. So she allowed a lot of room for that. Um, Lean is a massive thing about team. And that goes for not just like the, the that's crew, everybody. She loves getting people together as a team and creating that. And I think she set that up and we would, the odd time when there was enough time to do it before the day would even start, you would quickly play like uh, at almost theater games to a degree that like you would play a quick game or every moment run lines really quickly or move around the space just to get into it. So we were all collectively there together. And I think that that set a precedent for the rest of the show. She really set up that element of, of what that place is. It's a workplace, you are a team, your desk is a team, these are your people. Um, so she done an incredible job of that. And she Lena makes things fun, which I, she brings so much energy and she's like a huge, it, engine of like fun on a set that I think was needed here to keep that up there all the time and everyone as mean as they are a lot of it's banter right it's constant banter who can be funnier who can be who can have a meaner quip who can be a slightly more evil but in the most wittiest way and that creating that energy uh she she yeah she kind of guided us all towards that really well I think yeah. and I, I think yeah, it's good. Sorry, no, I'm just saying I think I love her episode. I just think it's brilliant. It really sets the, the world really well. It really does. And there's such a specific pacing that comes into the show in terms of not just the, the way that visually it looks, but the dialogue and, and the way that that fires off. And I imagine that that was something that was a very, very specific choice that they made at the beginning and was interested in how that informed a lot of the choices that you made in terms of the conversation and how it flows when you're in scenes with other mm. actors. Yeah, I think like there was one thing that we done with Lena, which was like running the thing as fast, like like a rid ridiculously fast, and just coming in on top of each other to create that. So then, when you came to shoot it, you were ready to go, you know. Um, and that that kind of lives throughout it, doesn't it? It's very fast paced world. We were saying this the other day, actually. Episode one to me, I was like, whoa, it's over. It like goes at such a pace. And so much happens and then it's gone. And I think that's, you know, that's the world. Their world is like that. It's like high adrenaline, make money fast and get out fast, you know? Yeah. And then I wanted to ask you a little bit about working with some of the other cast because, you know, as we were mentioning earlier with like David, Harry, Mahal and Marisa, this was their first time coming into a series and coming into mm -hmm. a show and a project like this. And, you know, is there is there a difference kind of coming in and just, the myriad of working styles that were coming in across everybody and the way that everybody approached things or did it really just kind of like meld together that everybody kind of naturally wanted to work in the same way because I always think that's so interesting with actors because you all everybody has their own style and how they like to work but you have to mold into each other. Totally that's an interesting question because I think a lot of us do work in a very different way but I never felt that that was that noticeable on the set when we were sh shooting scenes. What I did notice was was 
people prepare in different ways. You know, like David's meticulous. He's meticulous. And and that as where I, I, I don't know whether this is a good or a bad thing to say, but I, I don't like to over prepare. I like to research and I like to, I'll know my lines, but I don't like to plan what I'm going to do because I, f- I love it being organic on the day. And especially with the camera on you, I, 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 I like, playing with it and risking it and seeing, hoping, praying that the magic is there when it's there. And luckily with, uh, you know, the majority of my stuff is with Marisa. Marisa is a very similar approach, but also Marisa is so spontaneous on set and that we we had a really brilliant relationship and we really trusted each other. So because most of my stuff was with her, I didn't get to see, I don't know what everybody else was necessarily like in their approach on set, but it felt very fluid. It felt very together. It felt like everyone you know it's so well cast julie harkin is such a brilliant casting director but she i think she'd done such a brilliant job that everybody had a little bit of themselves in each character you know that it that it, then that you just had to bring that and that's why it worked you know not that i'm anything like any <laughs> but i mean like you know what i mean it's just energy i suppose is what i mean but yeah, um, yeah <laughs> And in terms of that that spontaneous discovery, was it something where you had much of an opportunity to rehearse scenes or was it really just discovering those moments and finding that fire once you were on camera together? Yeah, I mean, you always do camera rehears- rehearsal. You always do it. Um, me-, me and Marisa never worked outside. And we could have. We could have genuinely set. Our apartments were very close. We never did. We never sat and done that thing where we like, we would run lines together. We would always like on the day be like sit in each other's trailers and run the lines so we knew them. But we never planned or plotted or or rehearsed the the emotion. Um, we did do a little bit of rehearsal as a group with the directors before doing before a block, which was really useful and and, and really helpful. And um, especially with some stuff where it was it was huge numbers of people together to have that kind of semi blocked in your mind a little bit. It was so useful for the day because there's just so much going on, especially like the big dinner scenes and the big pub scenes. So that was really useful. Um, but there wasn't that much, no. Yeah. And you were talking a little bit before about, you know, obviously the creative team were giving you a lot of those details about Kenny and where his behavior come from, came from. And that was a lot of the early discussion. Mm-hmm. But I imagine that you didn't have those scripts because it's really kind of the last couple of episodes is really when we kind of get undercover with him and really start to understand where he's coming from and how he's turned into this version of himself. Yeah. Uh, and so were they giving you a lot of those kind of very specific details? You know, there's even just tiny lines about, oh, you know, my family is a bunch of piss heads and there's just lots of like tiny little lines and tiny little details about his life outside of what we see in the office as well. And there's kind of like self-loathing. Like he does, there's a huge self, and something strikes me that Kenny doesn't have him any friends, or there's something very lonely about him, you know. Hence him being so bitter, probably. But it, it, they didn't, you know, we didn't have those scripts, and what they did steer me towards was try and be as light with everything. If you can be light with everything and throw a lot of it away, it still stings. He's still saying those words; they're still having an impact, but that it leaves it a bit more like is he being really like this or is you know that leaves that slight question of doubt um and i'm kind of glad of that because i don't think we as people carry our trauma with us when we're behaving in one Mm -hmm. you know what i mean we react to situations in a very visceral way most of us so i think if i hadn't known that i might have maybe tried to fit in this like slightly tragic element to him and i don't think that would have worked for the show you know because then when you hear it you're like oh which is real life, right? Whenever you, that's why I love the writing on this. It's so, it used to pull the rug f- from underneath me constantly. I'm like, oh, I didn't see that coming. And so that um, is true to life, I think. Yeah. Did you, did you find yourself discovering a lot of additional layers to him and understanding the work environment that he had come up in when he first came into the industry? Once you got the script for that episode where he pays for the lap dance for yeah. him. Because that's that to me, the fact that he doesn't understand that there's anything wrong with that, particularly with a subordinate, says so much about the world in which he was kind of professionally raised, so to speak. Totally. And he says in that episode, doesn't he? He says, I'm just trying to treat you how I was treated, I think is one of his lines. Um, yeah, that that did like it became very clear to me as we went on. And I mean, I kind of had a sense of this 
from the beginning. I think we had the first maybe five apps by the time we were shooting app two, probably we, we had the first five apps. Um, but I had a sense of Kenny's not from the same background as most of these boys. He's not as wealthy. He's not as well educated. He's done really well and worked his way up and it's cost him a lot to get there. And I feel like that shapes everything that he is. He's jealous. He's angry that he had to work harder. And he also knows he's probably not going to go as far as most other people will go. He might have reached his glass ceiling already. You know, he might be there. Um, so, yeah, that definitely came out as the, the series went on and started shaping who he is and what he was. And um, But I, I think I had enough of it in there at the start that I was able to use it a bit. I don't know. I don't know. Did you view, because obviously he sees Yasmin as an incredible threat. He's, he, you know, he's that type of manager that sees the success of someone else and someone else even having a voice as a threat to his own kind of like stature. Mm -hmm. Did you view it as something where he would behave that way with anyone who's entry level and just like anyone coming up is a, is a threat to him? Or what, did you kind of view it as like male, female specific to a degree as well and, and misogyny? I I think there's a few things going on there. I think it is misogyny, I, no doubt. I also think if she had have went along with that first interaction where she says, oh, and he goes, who, what do you, you know, he, the first thing we say, oh, we should get off the desk sometime. And when she bats, when she adds in, oh, I have a boyfriend that he takes that, he has a reaction to it. That is, I think if that had never happened, I wonder, I wonder what life would have been like with they just went for the coffee. I, mm, I don't know. So I do think, yes, misogyny is a huge part, part of it. I think age is a huge part of it. I also think her background and her wealth mm -hmm. and her, you know, he says at one point, um, it's good to see a social education really pays off. He's jealous of that word. He want, he's worked to try and be part of that when he never can. And so there's that added into it. That to, from the outset, it looks like to him, it looks like everything comes easy to her because mommy and daddy do it for her. Mommy and daddy sort it out and... So there's so many layers to what she represents so many things that he can't stand that there, there's a few different things going on there. But undeniably, I mean, misogyny's the, the, the driving force without him even realizing probably that he's a misogynist. I bet you Kenny's the type of guy that goes, no, I treat, treat women the way that I like to be treated, which is like shit. So yeah, do you know what I mean? It's, um, he's not, I don't know if he's the brightest or the, the the most aware person in the world. Yeah, it's also it, it's also interesting to to watch kind of the confidence that he has in doing this in public in front of his coworkers as well. Mm -hmm. And it also says a lot about the environment that nobody stops him. But did you kind of think yourself a little bit about how far Kenny could push this and, and kind of what those limits would be in terms of what he could get away with? Yeah. Definitely, I, 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 there was, there's this, yeah, there was a scene with me and Mahalo where we had a standoff. And I'm like, would he throw a drink around her? No, he wouldn't do that. You know what I mean? He wouldn't, he wouldn't push it that far. He wouldn't um, do that. And then even with the strip club scene, he leaves at the end because I think he cottons on. He goes, this is awkward. She looks uncomfortable. I've crossed the line. What do I do? I'm just going to run. I'm going to get out. And so he leaves. Um, so there is definitely an awareness at a certain point, but it's always when it's too late. It's always when he's already screamed or shouted. It's always when he's already pushed it too far. And I think that night after the the, the lap dance, he rings her lots, doesn't he, when she's in bed? Because he, know, he knows, he knows he's messed up. And so, yeah, he knows where the boundary is. He just sat, he, he steps over it and then retreats really quickly behind it again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Is there is there a particular scene that you found to be the most challenging in terms of figuring out how to approach it, the nuances or, or kind of what you had to do in terms of your performance? Trickiest one. There's two probably that, that the scene around the dinner table in episode two. My approach there, I, I was very, I, I didn't know if it was the right thing to be what type of anger was it all out just like visceral rage because he's drunk or is it like malicious and pointed or so i tried to do somewhere in between um and i did find that scene quite challenging um and i was very nervous about it about doing it on the day um and then the other scene is in episode eight 
when they talk about the cultural fit that it was and it wasn't like I knew what I had I knew what was needed it was being able to pitch it in the right place um and the twist in it as well so those two scenes kind of to me were the 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 toughest I think um but nothing was too stressful or difficult it's it's really weird in the once I watch it I'm like and any of my friends who watch that are family are like you're utterly horrible um but when me and Marisa were shooting them we had a laugh which is really messed up we are really bad gigglers we make each other laugh all the time we're so much fun we love messing about and so I like really fun memories nothing seems stressful or hard really you know but um that's the magic of tv (laughs) you quickly a little bit about screenwriting that is one of the things that you've been doing over recent months you wrote a great short that was nominated for BAFTA um, and you and Jamie Dornan have, have talked about how you've actually been working on a feature script together recently. Yeah. And I was curious about that in terms of how that creative collaborative process has worked, because obviously we're not all in the same room together. So it's the first time that you're writing a feature script together and then having to navigate what that working style looks like and then put it in a remote setting as well. So it's, I was just interested in kind of like how you both navigated that and figured out what, what was the best way for you to work together in such a creative space. It was interesting. We've had this idea for a long time and we always speak about it when we meet up or, you know, if we've had a few drinks, we're like, we need to write this together, man. Um, and eventually when this happened, there was like, I don't know about you, but there was like six weeks at the start of this where I was incapable of doing anything at all whatsoever. My brain, brain was in like a funk, um, as was his, but we were always chatting on the phone. And then I was like, well, we just try and write this story. And initially what we'd done was we we had tried to write separately as in like we got together on zoom we wrote down a basic like spine of a story and then went away and was like right well i'll write this scene you write this scene we tried to do that and it failed very quickly because it was just wasn't it was so like that so then what we would do and this is nuts he we would sit on zoom for like six, seven, eight hours a day. And sometimes not even be talking, sometimes like be walking about thinking in the background and we just left Zoom on. And that was the, the only way we could do it. And then when lockdown eased here um, in the summer, we just got in a room together and finished it off and like fixed what we needed to fix. Um, so it was interesting. The, the thing with that, I, I don't know if, the script's so personal to us. It, I'm not just saying this, because I know this sounds like a really like normal thing to say, but it, it, wrote itself that script wrote it's it had its own um momentum and so i don't know if it would have been the same with something slightly trickier um but it was so personal to the both of us that it kind of we knew where we were going um so yeah it worked really fine it was easy the start was tricky but then once we were in a flow of it and it was a matter of just sitting at the computer all day yeah well i can't wait to see kind of the, the finished version once oh, i hope so i hope so we're in very early stages and we've very exciting people uh, joining the journey. So hopefully by the end of next year, we might have something maybe. Oh, fantastic. I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. And thank you so mm-hmm. much. It's been such a, a genuine pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Oh, cheers, Maya. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.